This is Tripwire Week in Review for the week ending March 15th, 2024. I'm Haley Keen with Trap, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Lonnie Hendry, Chief Product Officer, and Stephen Bushbaum, Research Director. This week, the February Consumer Price Index figures came in slightly hotter, PPI came in significantly higher, and retail sales were below consensus. In the midst of all the economic news came the headline from Dollar Tree that there will be just under 1,000 store closures coming. So what news makes our headlines this week, Stephen? Oh, as much as it pains me to talk about it, and I was just griping a little bit about this in the webinar this week, I, I have to say the inflation headlines probably stick out as being the dominant one. So what was interesting this week is CPI and core CPI came in slightly hotter than what everybody had forecast. And I, to some extent, that was almost a relief that it wasn't worse news. And so equities kind of bucked off that news, they, they shrugged it off and proceeded to march higher. Things felt okay. And then we head into Wednesday and Thursday. We saw some weakness kind of percolate on Wednesday. And then Thursday, the PPI dropped. And that, I think, was an ice bath for markets. At least that's what it felt like to me, given how equities have reacted and bond yields have reacted. The producer price index, or PPI, headline PPI on a month-over-month -month basis came in double what the consensus forecast was. The month-over-month -month increased by 0.6%. Economists had forecast 03 And the prior month's increase was 0.3% month-over-month. Now, moving to core PPI, that wasn't quite as bad. It was an increase of 0.3% month over month for core PPI versus a forecast of 0.2 and the prior month's increase of 0.5. The combination of these two prints, how I'm seeing, you know, the market reaction function to them was that, you know, bond yields have marched up considerably higher this week and equities are starting to show some weakness. So if we take this in combination with some weaker than expected retail sales. And then the interesting piece, as you mentioned, was the family dollar news this week. So I, rather than keep droning on here, I want to get Lonnie's thought on, Lonnie, how do you read the family dollar news? Is this playing into the weakness we saw in the retail sales data, or is there something else going on here? Yeah, I think the family dollar stuff is interesting because effectively you had the merger that took place between those two budget retailers. You know, I think the question for all of us now is with family dollar is, was this a planned part of the merger where they had non-performing stores. And so it's just now breaking news to the public, but this is something that had been contemplated for a while. Or is this something more closely tied to the lagging retail sales that you mentioned? I think it's probably part of the strategy go forward. I mean, if you look at the numbers, they announced they're gonna close about 600 stores. I think they have, depending on who you, you trust for the numbers, somewhere between 15 and 1600 stores nationally. So it's not a, an insignificant number, but it's not like you're closing 80% of the stores either. And I think what happened here is a lot of these stores really popped up during the pandemic in secondary and tertiary markets where there was a lack of available uh, grocers. And so they kind of filled that void for the time being. And it's an interesting challenge. And we've seen a lot of commentary in the social media sphere of, you know, this is another example, Stephen, of supposed credit tenants effectively closing stores, filing bankruptcy, et cetera, et cetera, where you have a single tenant, everyone loves that, you know, mailbox money, as they say, until the tenant decides they're going to close a significant number of stores. And in this case, similar to what we talked about a little bit a couple of weeks ago with the big box retailers, it leaves a dent, but, but unlike the big box retailers, they're there's really not a secondary user. I mean, like, I don't know who's going to move into these metal buildings that have a little bit of rock facade on the front in these secondary locations and pay anywhere near the rents that were in place for these build the suit type of, of transactions. So it'll be very interesting to see. I know you guys on the research team put some stuff out this week that talked about exposure, number of properties and, and loan balances and, and lease expiration. So I'll let you dive into that. But I think it's Something that's going to be headline worthy for the next couple of weeks, for sure, as people kind of parse through through the data. Sure. So what we did on the, the research side was first we wanted to start off with, well, what is family dollars footprint? And so it amounted to just under $800 million uh, in exposure to family dollar leases spread across 247 properties. A lot of these are concentrated within Texas and Florida within the CMBS universe with around $112 million in Texas and 85 million in Florida. And together that represents about 25% of the, the total exposure. What's I think 
particularly important, getting to something you pointed out here, Lonnie, is that approximately 53% of the properties or 247 properties with exposure family dollar are single tenant properties. Now, the good news for CMBS investors out there is that this only accounts for just under 104 million of that 794 million in loan exposure, or just 13%, right? I mean, this is it's just kind of like the basic math of, well, if it's single tenant and it's family dollar, those tend to be a lot smaller properties. On the single tenant side, these properties generally range from about 8,000 to call it 12 or 13,000 square feet in size. You know, what we had seen over the last year with some of these companies like, say, Bed Bath & Beyond, who shed locations, that ended up being a net positive for some of these properties because they're, the, the landlords were able to go back in and ultimately backfill that space with tenants that were paying higher rent, whether that was one tenant taking all of the space or subdividing it up. Now, with family dollar locations, you're not really looking at an, an equivalent type situation here. So these could end up being more of the typical net negative type events because, well, who's going to take a single tenant pad site, a family dollar, if ultimately the core weakness, the fundamental weakness in that property was was low foot traffic or just poor economics of, of that site selection. Um, and so there might be some unfortunate impairment situations here that we're looking at. Fortunately, again, back to the, high, the bigger picture here, if these are single tenant properties that they're shedding, and in particular, if they're focusing on near-term lease expirations, this might not be as painful as the headlines were, would suggest. And so turning to the lease expiration schedule, when we looked at the near-term lease role for family dollar, you have 24 properties with family dollar exposure where the leases expire in 2024 with a total outstanding balance of 7.4 million, 11 of these are single tenant. And then in 2025, you have 33 properties with leases expiring with family dollar, totaling 6.2 million in exposure. Six of them are single tenant properties. And so when you turn to the multi-tenant properties with exposure to family dollar, you do get to a slightly higher loan balance, but there's not a lot of underlying weakness that I saw in the loan performance for those multi-tenant exposures you had a very small percentage. It was only 33 million in loans with family dollar expiring in 2024 or 2025, where the debt yield on those loans was below 10%. So generally they're in good multi-tenant locations. The question will be, what if any of those are they going to shed? Will that end up being a positive for the multi-tenant? And then what kind of shedding will they do on the single tenant side? Yeah, I think the, the single tenant is the concern. The multi-tenant facilities are, you know, the strip center, location that those are in, in most cases, are going to have strong fundamentals. We've talked about strong absorption with vacancy being at all-time lows and, and occupancy being really solid. So I don't think that's a concern. There are a couple of people on Twitter that I mentioned earlier, I didn't really give them credit, but Jason Richards said lots of dollar store real estate investors are about to find out that buying dressed up metal buildings with one tenant and above market rents can get complicated quickly. And then Jason Miller had some stuff out there. I thought he had some good points. He said, off-price retailers like TJ Maxx and Burlington backfilled hundreds of big box stores when Toys R Us and Bed Bath & Beyond went under. But Family Dollar has also been taking over vacant drugstore sites, um, but there's really no major tenant just sitting in the wings to backfill those those spaces that they're going to uh, vacate. So this will be something we keep an eye on. I mean, to your point, Stephen, the big picture, this isn't something that's multi-billion dollar exposure. And I think this is headline-worthy but I don't think it makes a huge, a huge dent in the retail space broadly, um, nor do I think it's something that's going to be systemic across other retailers. I think this is something where the merger has something to play with it. And um, and we'll see, you know, we'll see how things go. I, you did mention a lot of other stuff that I didn't have a chance to really comment on. So we'll kind of leave it as it is. But a couple of interesting nuggets I did want to just add. U.S. GDP is up for six straight quarters and rising three plus percent this quarter. So to your narrative on the inflation numbers coming in hotter than expected, the economy is still from a quarter over quarter perspective looking really, really strong too. And I don't think that we're getting enough discussion around housing prices continuing to rise across the U.S. with the higher interest rate environment, which is just counterintuitive. And so if you look at that, coupled with unemployment still being at all-time lows, I'm with you. I mean, I think this puts the Fed in a really tough spot. And I, I wouldn't be shocked if you start hearing some murmuring of them potentially even raising rates at some point in 24 to really kind of tamp this down. One interesting piece of news came from Ken Griffin at Citadel. The hedge fund 
saying, and this was a big headline because, you know, he gets a lot of people's ears, saying that he thought it would be a mistake and caution the Fed against cutting rates too quickly and advise they take a more patient stance because the last thing that the Fed wants to see and many economists would, would like to see would be inflation to pick back up and the Fed ultimately end up having to raise rates to your point, Lonnie. Um, because that could be a lot more damaging to the economy and ultimately push us closer to that hard landing scenario were that to happen. Okay, so since you guys talked about the family dollar, Dollar Tree retail news, I think we can jump into our retail segment. Today in our rundown newsletter, we talked about the Kenwood Town Center, which is a shopping mall in Cincinnati that has been refinanced with a new $260 million mortgage. Can you guys break down the story? Sure. So the, the Kenwood Town Center shopping mall in Cincinnati has been refinanced with a $260 million mortgage provided by a group of CMBS lenders. So the property's owner, a venture of Brookfield Property and Teacher's Retirement System of the state of Illinois, was able to take $41.23 million of cash out of the property. So let me just pause back up here. We're seeing a cash out refi of a mall in Cincinnati. That's right, folks, a cash out refi. This is this is great news, um, and to the point of the the headline, you know, not all malls are created equal. It's not all doom and gloom out there in mall space. A couple of years ago, it would have seemed like a cash out refi of a shopping mall was a near impossibility. Certainly, with the 2020 pandemic lockdowns, this property is anchored by Nordstrom, Macy's, and Dillard's, and the inline store sales an often used gauge of a property's performance, last year totaled $779 per square foot. And that doesn't count the roughly $8,800 per square foot of sales that the property's Apple store generated. Add that store in and the store sales amounted to just over $1,000 per square foot. That compares with the $637 per square foot Sans Apple uh, inline sales the property generated in 2019. Fast forward, it's clearly performed extremely well post-2020. This isn't just a flash-in-the-pan bit of revenge shopping. This is obviously sustainable progress and a, a, a great location or a great mall in the city. So this property was built in 1956 and encumbered by a $210 million loan that was provided in 2021. The floating rate loan had paid a rate pegged to LIBOR plus 340 basis points. The five-year loan that has replaced it pays an interest-only coupon at 6.271% for its full term. That rate amounts to a spread of 213 basis points spread to treasury. It's very likely that the Brookfield, Illinois venture would have opted for a 10-year loan if rates were lower. But given what we've seen in the new issue market, the, the five-year deals continue to dominate. Yeah, so let me give a little bit of color on the collateral for this deal, Stephen. So they have a really impressive tenant roster, which is, uh, I think, what you would expect for a cash out refi on a, on a mall in today's market. But tenant include Apple, Pottery Barn, Dillard's, Anthropology, Our House Furniture, they have a couple of restaurants, Cheesecake Factory, Banana Republic, Sephora, Tiffany, Pottery Barn Kids, William Sonoma, Louis Vuitton, Maggiano's, Athleta. So pretty stacked and all with good solid sales. It's interesting, you mentioned some of the sales per square foot on this recent refinance. I wanted to go back in time and look at how that's changed. So I pulled up the, uh, the information in our system back when this property refinanced in 2021, and you highlighted this. In 2019, Apple store sales were $9,405 a square foot. Uh, in this most recent reported uh, refi, they were at 1,018. So they've seen about a five, six hundred, you know, seven hundred dollar a square foot increase in sales. But if you want to just measure the magnitude of COVID in 2020, Apple sales at that point were $4,027 a square foot. So 2019, 9,400. 2020, 4,027. 2024 back up to pre-pandemic of 1018. And if you look at the inline sales, $943 a square foot in 19, decimated down to 539 in 2020, and then this year back up to uh, 779. So really strong sales and, and actually indicative of, of the tenant roster and the location of stuff that you talked through. So it's great to see. I don't know if this means I have to sunset the cashinrefi.com domain or if this is a one-off, but I think, you know, for this week's edition of the podcast, it's great to start off with a story that has some really good takeaways. I mean, this is what we were talking about ad nauseum in, in 2021, where people being able to refi, cash out, and then put that capital to work elsewhere. 
Um, so it's really great to see this happening. And in Cincinnati, of all places, I think is a really good sign. And then we had a few retail sales this week. We had Styles paying $30 million for South Florida Shopping Center. So Styles Corporation, they, they purchased uh, Shoppers Haven for $30 million, or about $145 a square foot. It's a 206,000 square foot retail property in Papano Beach, Florida. Um, Styles Corp is located in Fort Lauderdale. And they bought the center from Partridge Equity, which is also in uh, Pompano Beach, which purchased the property for $50 million in 2016. Marcus and Milichap was the broker on the latest sale. Uh, First Horizon Bank provided the new buyer with $36 million worth of a loan. Um, and that's according to a report from the South Florida Business Journal. Properties on 22 acres uh, across multiple addresses. And again, this is another one that has tenants that include Michaels, Bales. Uh, Walgreens, Party City, uh, Outback Steakhouse, and uh, a few other small uh, retail tenants. And then secondly, P uh, Publix purchased a retail center uh, at Anchors for $75 million. So the supermarket bought the Key Plaza Shopping Center, 231,000 square foot retail property. This property is in Key West. They paid $75 million for it, which equates to about $325 a square foot. This story comes to us from Commercial Observer. Um, JLL Capital Markets brokered the transaction, and this property is located at 2900 North Roosevelt Boulevard, was built in 1991, and has some other retail tenants that include Office Max, and at least for now, a Dollar Tree. Dun, dun, dun. We'll see if they make it past the uh, the sale and the store closures. Good tie-in there. <laughs> Let's talk about Office now. We have a lot of stories this week. Some bad and maybe one or two good, but it seems like a lot of loans headed to special servicing and some value reductions. Yes. So first up, we have a modification request since a Raleigh office loan to special servicing. According to February remittance data, the $21.2 million Capital Bank Plaza loan has been transferred to the special servicer. And the commentary states that's because of cash flow issues and the borrower is requesting to change to interest-only payments. The asset behind this loan is a 148,000 square foot office property in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was built in 1965 and renovated in 2002. Now, we warned in Trepwire that investors should keep an eye on this loan back in 2018 when Capital Bank was planning to move from the Capital Bank Plaza to a new downtown development, and that bank vacated the property in 2021. So we wrote about that event back in August 2021, and we noted that the architecture and engineering firm Clark Nexon, who had a lease that ended in June 2022, would be moving from its Raleigh offices as well. So a couple of ominous headlines leading up to this event. So the debt service coverage on a net cash flow basis fell below 1.0 in 2021 and has recently been in negative territory. For the first three quarters of 2023, the loan posted a debt service coverage ratio of minus 0.17 times. The occupancy was 96% in 2020. In 2021, occupancy fell to 52% following Capital Bank's departure. And in 2022, occupancy dropped to 32% after Clark Nexon moved away from the property. So over the first nine months of 2023, occupancy held at 37%. This is one of those stories, Stephen, where, you know, if you dig a little bit beyond the numbers, the occupancy here is pretty telling. I mean, they lost tenants starting in 2021. They had really strong occupancy in 2020, which coincides with the pandemic, 96%. They're now at 37% occupancy. So in addition to the debt service being as low as it is, this is a property that in order for them to get new tenants, you have to imagine they're going to have to put forward a bunch of TI allowance. They're going to have to put forward a bunch of leasing incentives and other things to get somebody to take the space. So this is another one of those stories where it's not just the debt service as currently constituted that shows the distress on this property. Anyone trying to buy this has to underwrite those additional costs to try to get the property back up to operating standard. And that's going to be a costly endeavor. And I think, you know, we're going to start seeing more and more of these as we go through our stories where it's not just the headline news of we lost two tenants. It's the reality now that in order to re-tenant those spaces, it's not like the good old days where the landlord had the ability to just put a sign up and some tenant reps started bringing people in to fill the space. That's a much more labor-intensive, cost-intensive uh, endeavor for these landlords at this point where break-even on a new lease might not be for a couple of years. 
So next up, we have a Portland office loan gets transferred to the special servicer. The $19.1 million 220 Northwest 8th Avenue loan was transferred to the special servicer due to loan payment default. And this is an office building in Portland, Oregon that spans 67,000 square feet that was built in 1901 and renovated in 2017. In February 2021, we wrote in Trepwire that WeWork was closing its U.S. Custom House location, which is the property behind this loan. WeWork was the sole tenant on a lease that ran until 2032. Servicing commentary states that WeWork terminated their entire lease in June 2021, paying a one-time termination fee, after which the borrower has executed a replacement lease with another co-working uh, space tenant, Industrious, who will occupy about 42,000 square feet. However, as of December 2023, the commentary suggests that tenant improvement construction said delays preventing the new tenant from taking occupancy and the property from generating any income. This tenant transition took the occupancy on the loan from 100% down to 63%. The loan remained current throughout the pandemic, but is now 60 days delinquent as of the February, February 2024 remittance data. So obviously with WeWork out and them being the sole tenant, cash flow has taken a massive hit. So the debt service coverage ratio in 2022 fell to minus 0.77, from 1.76 times in 2021. And for the first nine months ending 2023, the loan posted a debt service coverage ratio, slightly better, but still negative, of minus 0.61 times. And this loan matures in December, 2027. Yeah, you can go ahead and chalk that one up for December 27, the extension modification. <laughs> I know it's 2024, and there's a long time between now and then, but you know, I think if you're a lender, how far out do you think they're looking at this, Stephen? Like, are you, you know, we're we're talking about, and on every pre presentation that we do, it seems like everyone's most interested in, and rightfully so, the 2024 maturities, 2025 maturities, et cetera. But I got to think if you're on the lending side and you're sitting on these loans, I want to look at like, what is my exposure over the next five years or so? Because I think that there's a potential for the loans that mature in 26 and 27. Supposing the office market stays the same where return to work is kind of like, eh, there's a lot of people still working from home or hybrid schedule. It's probably going to be worse than for some of them. You know, I mean, like as bad as it feels now for the office sector, you still have a lot of tenants that were locked in the pre-pandemic leases that are still kind of bolstering the sector. You know, I don't know, what are your, what's your sense if you're a lender? Are you looking out? to 27, 28, 29? Or are you really just focused on what's going to roll in the next 12 to 24 months? For me, on a story like this, personally, I'm not looking more than one or two years out. Um, you know, for an asset like this, where the replacement tenant still has a lot of question marks about, you know, will this business plan succeed? And what's the rest of this building ultimately going to stabilize at? Now, for the, the broader market, sure, I might be able to wrap my head around you know, 26, 27. But, you know, to get back to our, our intro commentary, I start to wonder if, you know, this hire for longer does continue to play out. And, you know, there's there's kind of a wide range of scenarios now on the table. Gosh, I have a hard time playing with conviction that far out. Um, but that being said, everything has a price. So if it's a low enough leverage, core location, everything's going for it, absolutely. I'll, I'll play out the 27, no problem. Uh, but something like this, there's just too much concentration risk, uh, too many question marks lingering out there for me to say, you know, there's so much variance in the value estimates for something like this um, or in the, the rent levels that we could stabilize at. So up next, we have what I would say is maybe some mixed greens. Uh, and what would typically be a crabgrass type situation. So Chicago office has had its value cut for a third time, but there's some signs that maybe a residential conversion could save the day. So the Chicago office backing the $100 million 135 South LaSalle loan received its third reduction appraised value according to March remit data. The value is reduced to $67.7 million, according to a January 2024 appraisal, and that's down from the January 2023 appraised value of $90 million. At securitization in 2015, the collateral was valued at, wait for it, $330 million. To put some, I think, more relevant numbers to it, the LTV has gone from 30% at securitization to now 148% 
based on this new $67.7 million value. So to pause here and put this in context, when we hear things like, oh, don't worry, we're incredibly low leverage. You know, we have a lot of equity buffer to absorb any sort of value declines. A story like this shows um, in the office sector, nobody's safe. You know, to be able to go from 30% LTV all the way up to 140, 148% in an eight, nine year time span is, is astonishing quite frankly. Now, we need to dig a little bit deeper into the data here to understand what's going on and why the value has fluctuated and why this is, in my mind, potentially a mixed green, perhaps heavy crabgrass mixed in here type story. So the collateral is a 44-story building plus three below grade uh, levels, totaling 1.3 million square feet. This is an office property that was constructed in 1934 renovated in 2013, 2014. The loan has seen its cash flow plummet of the last few years after the largest tenant, Bank of America, vacated part of their space in 2020 and the remaining space in 2021. And Bank of America occupied 820, call it 827,000 square feet, accounting for 62% of gross leasable area and 56% of underwritten base rent. At year end 2020, the debt service coverage on net cash flow was 4.98 times when occupancy was 86%. Now, fast forward to 2023 year end, debt service coverage on a net cash flow basis was minus 2.54 times when occupancy was 16% effectively empty. So how in the world then am I saying there's any mixed green in here? Well, let's look at the servicer comments. So first, what was interesting to me was that the servicer commentary over the past few months had indicated that workout and modification discussions are ongoing. Typically, when you see a loan with these sort of metrics, you don't get those sort of comments. So head scratcher, let's keep digging in. Second, and perhaps more importantly, last month's servicer comments stated that the lender is working with the borrower to allow them to obtain TIF financing for a partial residential conversion. And the bar was selected by the city to be one of four properties considered for the subsidies and the process is ongoing. So given the general buzz around office to residential conversions, this will be a loan to watch. So again, while I said there was some mixed green in here, it still is very heavy tilted toward the crabgrass, given that there's probably some sort of a value impairment. But the fact that the borrower is trying to find a path forward has applied for TIF financing, was selected by the city. These are all some good signs in a city that has had a lot of office value degradation. This reads to me, Stephen, kind of like a dumb and dumber where the guy's like, so you're you're saying there's a chance. That's exactly <laughs> it. You know, like mixed green, it would have to be all lowercase, right? Like there, <laughs> this is this is like barely registering on the scale of mixed green. But I'm gonna go with it for you. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna say, yeah, maybe there's a chance. Can we call it cat grass? You know, something, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, like something. So for those that listen, you know, you mentioned something. I thought we could jump on maybe as a little education segment here. You talked about TIF financing. So we may have some listeners that don't quite know what TIF financing is or what that means, but TIF is just an acronym that stands for tax increment financing. And so effectively what happens is certain cities and municipalities can set up what they call TIF districts, which are just geographically bound areas within their jurisdiction. And effectively they assess a tax for all the properties that are within that geographic boundary with the requirement that those additional tax levies have to be reinvested in that geographic area. So it effectively incentivizes people to move to that area because they know they're going to get additional reinvestment in that market. So for office buildings or other commercial properties, it's a nice kind of pay to play effectively where you're gonna get more attention to detail. So some examples here in Texas that I'm familiar with is you may get um, additional uh, cleaning services where they come and they actually power wash the sidewalks and they they power wash the the buildings at ground level or they trim the bushes so that they are you know carved into designs and they put fancy lighting on them so at night it's more inviting and those things where the building owners themselves are not responsible for doing that work but that work gets done through the use of TIF proceeds. Now in this example it sounds like they've set up a separate program for the conversion you know, my cynical comment on that would just be that office to resi is very expensive and the relative allocation of TIF dollars is not that much. So 
this would almost read to me like they've been awarded or qualified for some sort of a small grant. This wouldn't be enough in my mind. And I could be wrong. I'm not familiar with this particular uh, instance, but just in th in practice, uh, this would, would, would read to me as, you know, not something that's going to like tilt the scales to where this really maybe was a non-viable office to resi conversion. And because of the TIF financing, it now is magically viable. This would be more of, you know, kind of a, a lighter incentive that says, hey, we'd love to show our support, even if the allocation of TIF funds is not substantial. So uh, happy to jump on a call if anyone wants a deeper dive on TIF. It's really interesting. There's a lot of those types of programs. You also have a public improvement district or a PID, which is very similar. And so there's a lot of nuanced ways for local municipalities to really try to drive certain types of development or maintain a certain level of physical appearance within those geographic boundaries. And let's shift gears and talk about multifamily. This week we saw sales across the country and new financing for apartment properties. So we had a sale here in Tucson for $59.8 million. This was an affiliate of AHC Funds. They paid almost $60 million or 181000 per unit for peak at Oro Valley, which is a 330-unit apartment complex in Tucson. Uh, this was a Chicago private equity firm that purchased the property from ARPA Capital, LLC, which acquired the property back in 2021 for $54 million. Uh, Marcus and Millichap's institutional property advisors brokered the deal. So we've seen them the last couple of weeks. They've seemed to have a lot of uh, transaction activity in that line of business on the multi side, so which is which is great to see. Uh, properties encumbered by a $44 million Fannie Mae loan. This is another one, two weeks in a row, Stephen, where the loan is being assumed. Uh, this property was uh, provided that financing uh, last May. This uh, asset was built in 1984. It's at 8215 North Oracle Road, which is about 10 miles north of Tucson. Has one, two, and three bedroom units. Rents typically start around $940 a month. Um, what's interesting here is this property was probably purchased near the peak in 2021. And yet the previous owner was able to go ahead and exit this with a slight increase in, in sales price. So paid $54 million, sold for $59. That's a little bit counter to the, the narrative that we've seen, especially in the Arizona market. Obviously, Tucson is a little bit different than Phoenix, uh, but that was one of those general markets where you saw a huge run up in pricing up into 21. So I would take this as like really good green shoot uh, for that for that market. Up next, we have RPM Living buys 400-unit apartment property in Atlanta for $85 million. RPM Living Investments has paid $85 million, or $212,000 per unit, for Aspire Linux Park, a 400-unit apartment complex in Atlanta. The Austin, Texas company purchased the 10-building property from Willow Bridge Property Company of Dallas, which had bought it for $75.3 million a decade ago. RPM financed its acquisition in part with a $59.2 million Freddie Mac loan. Aspire Linux Park sits on about 15 acres at 1050 Linux Park Boulevard Northeast. The three-story property was built in 2000 and has one, two, and three bedroom units ranging from 745 to 2140 square feet. RPM is an interesting story, Stephen. They uh, started really small in Austin. I think they have vertical integration of their property management and acquisition, and they've really scaled over the last five or so years. It's really great to see they have properties now all across the Sun Belt. Um, they start off by just buying some local properties in the Austin area, and they've really ramped their business up. And seems like they're still very active in the market. So this is a, a good story. Atlanta is interesting. I don't know if you saw. I think Wall Street Journal had a had a story today about Atlanta, and um, it's interesting to see how the office market's really struggling, but we're we're still seeing some resilience across the retail and multi sectors in that uh, that part of the country. Yeah, and this is a particularly well-located apartment complex in what I would call a pretty desirable area of Atlanta. So this is, um, I think this is a very tactical move by RPM. I like it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I'm wondering if we're going to see more people lean into some of these Sunbelt markets where the national narrative is negative, but the underlying fundamentals in those local markets are still strong. So we have a couple of other sales here I'll run through quickly. Ideal Capital. Uh, purchased a Glendale, Arizona apartment for $108 million. They bought Cintio, a 325-unit property in Glendale. They paid $332,000 per unit for it. That comes to us from Multi-Housing News. Ideal Capital is a Clovis, California-based company. 
They purchased the three-story garden property from Heinz, which is based out of Houston, and CBRE was the broker on this deal. CBRE also originated a $60 million Freddie Mac loan to facilitate the purchase. Uh, this property is at 3600 West Happy Valley Road, opened last year and has a combination of one, two, and three bedroom units. Good story there. That would indicate to me that they've seen some pretty strong lease-up activity if it just opened last year and they were able to go ahead and exit, which I'll tell you, if Heinz is involved, it's usually going to turn out pretty well. The folks at Heinz, we know well, and they uh, they know what they're doing across multi-senior office. It's really great to see them operate another strong Texas company. Uh, Denver Area Apartment also sold uh, $74 million for this transaction. This was a venture between an affiliate of Obendorf Real Estate Management LP and Bascom Group. They paid $74 million, which equates to $205,000 per unit for the 360-unit Hearthstone at City Center Apartment. This is in Aurora, Colorado. Properties at 932 South Helena Way. was built in 84, has a mix of one, two, and three bedroom ranging between 720 square feet and 1,500. The venture is planning to renovate the units. They're going to upgrade appliances, replace flooring, as well as some of the common areas. So the takeaway for me on this one, Stephen, is this actually reads like a value add. I thought we had kind of reached the pinnacle of value add. It was like over the last five years, if you listed a property for sale, the OM was required to say value add. And with the interest rate hikes and everything that we've seen, you've really seen a pullback in value add interest. Uh, but it sounds like here they feel like there's still some meat on the bone, even at that uh, 205000 per unit price point. And I think to round out our property type segment, we still have a few stories left around the hotel and the industrial market. First up here, we have a San Jose hotel appraised value cut to below loan balance. The San Jose hotel behind the $16.9 million four points by Sheridan San Jose loan has seen another appraisal value reduction. According to February remit data, the hotel's appraised value dropped to $16.1 million, which is below the outstanding balance of $16.9 million. The hotel was valued at $46.5 million at securitization in 2014 before the value fell to $27.1 million in 2020 and then de decreased a few more times before reaching the most recent appraised value. The loan was transferred to the special in October 2022, and the borrower has been delinquent with payments, according to servicer commentary. The collateral is a 207 key hotel in Santa Clara that was built in 1990 and renovated in 2012. Servicing commentary suggests this hotel is now a Wyndham Garden Hotel due to an unconsented conversion from a Four Points Hotel by Sheridan, where the lender is now evaluating legal strategies. So this is an interesting one. You don't see this a lot where you have an unconsented conversion. So I think we're going to see this play out you know, for, for a while longer. Yeah, this is not typical. I'll tell you though, I haven't been on the road as much as I have the last couple of years. There's a lot of hotels that don't deserve the flag that they're bearing. I mean, they just haven't been maintained. And it's it's sad to see where you have some expectation. We're staying at a Marriott or a Hyatt and you roll up to the property and it's like, wow, those photos online were taken several years ago because the property doesn't look like that. And I did want to circle back on the slice of life. We had someone email in after my uh, Levick Hotel towel story wanting to know if, if this is a single-use towel guy or what. I'm like, yeah, man, of course. Like, I'm firmly in the single-use category. So um, I'm not judging anyone. If you're like a, you know, a towel recycler or whatever, good for you, save the planet. For me, I'm drying off with a towel one time, and it's going in the washing machine, bro. So uh, that's just how I roll. So we'll see how that plays itself out broadly. I don't know if we're going to get some feedback on that. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely take a shower, dry off. Get a new towel. Yeah, I will say, trying to think where I was at. I was in um, I was in San Antonio for a conference this last year, and I locked myself out of my hotel room, uh, which was not great. Like I had flipped the the top lock, thinking that it would hold the door open, but it was one of the new like ninety degree angle top locks, and those don't hold the door open. So I see the door closing, and it's like in my brain slow motion. I'm like, no, it slams. I have like, um, you know, just some whatever golf shorts on and some funky socks and I have to walk and I have, you know, just some t-shirt on. And I had, so luckily I was dressed, but I had to walk down to the, <laughs> the hotel desk with no shoes or whatever. And for those that know me, know I'm kind of a germaphobe. So like, I'm, that's not ideal, like walking around with no shoes. So I had to tell the front desk, like, yeah, I locked myself out of the room. So they actually have a tool. He came up in like three minutes. The guy like just popped the door right open, 
wedge this thing in there, flip the lock back, and I was able to get back in. So I didn't know how I felt about that either. Like it was so easy for them just to like yeah. open the door back up. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting takeaway. Hopefully that wasn't also at a conference hotel where you would run into some of your industry friends in the lobby with no shoes on. <laughs> yeah, it actually was. And I was a little bit nervous about that, but luckily it didn't happen. And if I had, I was just going to try to play it cool. You know, like what are the cool kids doing? This is what days? everyone's like, wearing. Yeah. Just walking around with, you know, some fancy socks and no shoes in a hotel. Sounds cool. <laughs> so up next, we have the wolf of real estate on Twitter. Wynn Resorts unveiled renderings for a $12 billion casino project located in New York City. This project would include an 80-story hotel tower, which houses the gaming facility, with office buildings, apartments, and a 5.6-acre park to surround the casino. New York City currently has no casino, but the state is considering giving away three gaming licenses at a whopping cost of $500 million per license. So there have also been discussions about a location here in Times Square, but this one I actually Actually was reading about this earlier today. I mean, this is a massive project over in the Hudson Yards district. The renderings look absolutely gorgeous. It would seem like a good location for it. I'm curious, curious your thoughts on this one, Lonnie. Yeah, given the activity in Hudson Yards, I would say that's probably the location, at least for one of the three licenses. And the renderings, obviously, they don't, don't always translate, but the renderings for this look pretty incredible. It's amazing how much power. So like we, we learn in the academic space that there's kind of four factors that influence value is physical, economic, government, and social. It's an acronym called PEGS. And government usually forces their imposition of, of value creation or locking down through zoning. But in this case, like this offering of a license that allows you to operate something has a the potential to have a really significant impact on the local economy, even with a cost to the developer of 500 million bucks. So it's just amazing for me to see, like having spent 25 years in the CRE space, how the dynamics are at play at all times. Like we're in this crazy market disruption, but the city tosses out, hey, we're gonna let some casinos come in. Oh, by the way, it's pay to play, it's 500 million. There's gonna be no shortage of people wanting to jump, you know, to get at that. Um, I think Hudson Yards makes sense. I think 5.6 acres right there with an 80-story hotel could be a really, really dynamic addition to the city. It'll be interesting to see, though, if this actually, if the city moves forward and this plays itself out. I mean, it's uh, a lot of states talk about doing stuff like this. It's another thing for them to actually award someone a license and then see what happens from there. So our last lodging story, we have the Lowe's Minneapolis Hotel sells for $23.5 million, according to Downtown Voices News. Previously known as the Lowe's Minneapolis Hotel, the 251-room hotel sold for $23.5 million in a deal that closed on March 1st, according to Hennepin County Property Records. That includes almost $2.5 million for furniture in the hotel. Completed in 2003, the hotel is connected to Mayo Clinic Square, previously known as Block E which now houses the Minnesota Timberwolves and links practice facilities and offices. The property last sold for $65 million in 2014 when it was named the Graves 601 Hotel. John Rizika of Marcus & Milchap told Finance & Commerce that the sale broke the price per room record in Minneapolis at almost $257,000 per room. Yeah, this is a story I think that just is indicative of kind of where Minneapolis is at right now. I mean, we've talked at length about the office sector and some of the large corporate tenants moving out. And now you're starting to see hotel transactions that were significantly less than they were at their previous um, sales price. But this is another story where in 2014, when they bought this, as you mentioned, it set the price per room record. And usually when that happens in a normal market cycle, you increase the risk of not being able to add value. And I think that's what's happened here. Maybe not to the extent that we're seeing here, like some of that's probably not organic value loss and it's it's there's some other market factors that we've discussed but you know every time i read a headline that says you know new price record or i see somebody that acquires an asset bragging about setting a price record i th i think man that it just in my risk meter goes off it's like increasing the risk because it effectively what you're saying is that you have some sort of an operational strategy that you think is better than the market and in practice it's just really hard to beat the market that's the reality Unless it's industrial. <laughs> yeah, industrial. Industrial, you can still be a genius just by owning the asset, right? So we've seen that play out with 
multifamily. We've seen that play out with a bunch of other asset classes. And it's interesting, the industrial stuff, we have a couple of stories here. I'll jump in, Stephen. Equus pays $124 million for North Carolina industrial portfolio. Uh, Equus Partners has paid InvestCorp about $85 a square foot for a portfolio of nine bulk distribution buildings. This uh, portfolio has 1.46 million square feet in the Charlotte and Greensboro areas. Equus, which is based in Newton in Newtown Square, Pennsylvania, uh, purchased the portfolio through its reinvestment partnership 12 LP value add fund. Say that five times fast. It lined up a $75 million loan from Franklin BSP Realty Trust to help finance the acquisition. And this is a short-term deal, three-year term. Eight of the buildings, which total about 1.22 million square feet, are concentrated in the Lincoln, Cleveland, and Iredell County submarkets. The other building, uh, which is 241,000, is in Greensboro. Portfolio is fully leased to nine tenants and has FedEx, Lenovo, and American Woodwork on the tenant roster. So it'll be interesting to see here. It's a three-year short-term financing deal, 100% leased. I'm assuming they think they can increase rents on this um, and reposition the asset to either lock in some longer-term financing on the back end of this or potentially increase an OI and try to position it for sale at the end of the three-year term. So up next, we have EQT extra pays $49.2 million for Tampa, Florida Warehouse. So EQT is paid $49.2 million or roughly $113 per square foot for the 436,000 square foot warehouse located at 6708 Harney Road in Tampa, Florida, according to the Tampa Bay Business Journal. The Wayne, Pennsylvania REIT purchased the industrial property from Highbrook Investors of West Palm Beach, which had bought it in 2021 for $35.28 million. The property is part of the collateral pool for a $26.47 million loan that's securitized through a CLO. A $13.37 million piece of that debt is allocated to the 6708 Harney building. The loan matures in September, but comes with a pair of one-year extension options. FedEx ground leases 308,000 square feet at the property. And then finally, our last industrial story, we have Brookfield pays $98 million for suburban Chicago industrial properties. And that equates to about, call it $77 per square foot for three industrial buildings totaling 1.28 million square feet in suburban Chicago. And this comes to us from The Real Deal. The New York investor purchased the properties from DWS. The buildings are at 340 Crossroads Parkway and 555 Remington Boulevard in Boiling Brook, Illinois, and 1125 Remington Boulevard in Romeoville, Illinois. They're fully leased by four tenants that have a weighted average lease term of 2.9 years, according to marketing materials. Yep. So this is another one with that short of a weighted average lease term that you're going to see some value add. And shout out to my little brother. He, he lives out there in Bolingbrook, Naperville area. So uh, strong industrial activity out there still. And so it's interesting. Brookfield had said they're going to, you know, try to divest of the office sector and really play in the industrial and data center space. And they're starting to see, we're starting to see some of those transactions take place. So let's jump right into shout outs this week. We had a lot of people who had sent us some thoughts and takeaways. So there's a bunch of people we need to get back to and we will. To start, we had Tammy G, who's a friend of ours and the firms who I got to connect with this week. And she had some good ideas for us. So we'll be talking to her again in the future. But she also gave you a shout out, Lonnie, for your commentary last week on the antiquated process around appraisals and valuation. So I know we'll have more to discuss on that, but she thought it was a good topic that we brought up. Yeah, we're going to put some stuff together to try to give some real life examples of, of how we can maybe have a more real real time mark to market type of process. You know, it's it's interesting, like that's the process that's in place and the system relies on it. So I understand the importance of it, uh, have that in my background. But at the same time, when we see these disruptions, looking at previous comps that traded in a different part of the market cycle it just doesn't make sense. And so uh, I appreciate that she enjoyed that. And as you mentioned, Haley, we'll have some follow-up here in the, in the next coming weeks. And up next, we have Emily R., who was actually a listener that we met live in California when we did our NAOP Silicon Valley podcast there. Uh, she is a CPACE financing expert and sent us over some of her thoughts and ideas. So we'll be connecting with you in the next few weeks to discuss 
some of these topics. And then our friend Christy, who recently sent us some takeaways on the New Orleans uh, office market, also sent us some of his findings from the, a recent Craft C Hydra event. Stephen, want to walk through what some of his takeaways were? Sure. So I'll start off with the the high level takeaway that overall sentiment seemed to be about the same in terms of mild op optimism amongst the panelists, mostly tied to Powell's assertion that rates have probably peaked, hopefully leading to the ever anticipated pickup in financing deal flow. Peak rates were also floated as providing a much needed bellwether for expiring rate cap dilemmas where borrowers are at best allocation crosswords, crossroads when cash is tight. So to say this another way, the rate cutting that will hopefully happen this year would be very welcome, but certainly with what we've seen over the last couple of weeks and higher for longer, I suspect that's eroding perhaps some of the sentiment in the background. So moving on to some of the individual points, special servicers have galvanized their positions that extensions and modifications are very tightly tied to increased borrower commitment to the asset. So we've been talking about for a while that loans are getting modified, but it's taking a capital commitment from the borrower to either pay down the loan or fund reserves for that to happen. Now, interestingly, they noted that pay down modifications also seem to be slowing, slowing as borrowers with multiple loans are starting to see them mature in close proximity to each other. So basically, capital is still scarce, even though we have dry powder. And so there's, uh, I think, some just natural uh, funneling going into, well, which assets are going to be the winners and which ones might we have to cut bait on. Uh, next up, we have SASB defaults are responsible for a large portion of the pain for the trusts and servicers right now. Uh, most of these loans were considered close to bulletproof given the quality of the assets and borrowers when they were underwritten, but the properties are showing real problem problems and many of the prominent borrowers are walking away. And then finally, advances have become a real concern for master servicers and other entities obligated to fund the trusts themselves. So during the GFC, rates were lower and fell as things progressed, making the advancing costs more negligible. This time around though, with prime between eight and a half and 9%, there's real money on the table with these advances. So um, once again, these SASB deals are a big source of pain, given that it's a concentrated risk. And when things go wrong, that is a lot of money that's having to be advanced. And with real rates where they are, uh, that, that comes with some pain. Yes. Yeah, so thank you to our listener and friend, Chris, for sending us those thoughts from the conference. On Twitter, we had Nola CRE, who gave you a shout out, Lonnie. He said, he wrapped up a call with you, and it was a pleasure to have someone so informed on TREP and the markets give him an overview. So to all of our listeners, if you want a demo from the chief product officer, you just have to tweet at him, it sounds like. I don't know if, Lonnie, you want this to turn into your day job, but I know you love what we do here, and you love showing people the use cases of, of how our data can impact their business and change their day to day. Yeah, even though we do the podcast once a week, I'm still in the product every day of the week. And so it's nice to jump on calls with folks that reach out and show them how they can leverage the tools to help drive revenue for their firms and some really young, hungry folks that I met with this week. And it's it's great that they uh, saw value in the meetings. And so, yeah, if you're interested in uh, jumping on a 15 or 20 minute, 30 minute call, uh, shoot me a shoot me a DM or tweet at me and we'll uh, we'll get that lined up. And you mentioned the person who reached out to us about the towels, but that was Trevor N. He actually titled the email Towel Wire, I think. And he also added that, Stephen, there's a thing called bath sheets instead of bath towels. So we might have to make some Trevor Wire podcast bath sheets and maybe we can make them beach towels too. We'll, we'll use them this summer. You know, I'm looking at them right now and they look glorious. So I, I agree. <laughs> this this needs to be part of our, our swag arsenal. We will look into those. Uh, Mike H. on LinkedIn is a loyal listener. He gave us some props from our last episode, 246, and pointed out some of the topics we talked about, like, have you noticed the lack of transactions in the missing middle lately? Is this partly why we have such a bid ask gap? So thanks for sharing some of our takeaways and the episode. Austin M. really enjoys the podcast and listens every week. Bill B says the podcast is standard Friday listening and was interested in some of our senior housing info we talked about. So we'll get back to you, Bill. Aaron M said he's been loving our podcast and he said that his company closed on a real estate loan back in 2021 and he was looking for updates. So it sounds like you might be 
the perfect candidate to jump on that demo with Lonnie and he can walk you through some of our latest data on that loan. But thanks for listening and we will get back to you. Aiden F was just listening to the recent podcast and was interested in our loan loss information and our rundown newsletter. Ben A is a longtime listener who was interested in any of our payoff and extension analyses. So we have a lot of this across different property types and a lot of this where you can find right in our platform. Jack B is a big fan of the podcast. And then we also heard from Joseph C, Randy S, Chris R, Freddie M, and David M. So before we close out this week's episode, Haley, we had talked internally because we were getting so much inbound activity from our listeners, which we love, but it's just really hard to squeeze a lot of the detailed, nuanced answers that people are looking for into our existing framework. So what we were considering is hosting maybe a special edition of the Tripwire podcast on a Tuesday, which we usually reserve for our guests. But instead of having a guest, really going through and doing a deep dive on some of the inbound questions that we've received from the audience, which got me thinking, we could definitely do that and we're happy to do that. But this is where I'd love to get some reaction from our listeners to say, would you prefer that we do a special edition podcast where we answer your questions in a podcast format? Or would you rather us host a Twitter Spaces or an X Spaces event where we join live and we do kind of a Q&A session on a Twitter Spaces. And so if you have strong feelings one way or another, send us an email and we'll try to uh, get that set up here in the next couple of weeks. We'll, we'll maybe set up a poll on Twitter and see if we can get some, some activity there. Although it seems like the polls don't usually get the type of response that you're hoping for. But if you have, uh, if you have some questions or you have interest in this or you have some feelings one way or the other, let us know and we'll try to make it an interactive event where we can answer questions near real time or real time, depending on the forum. Just a quick uh, joke here, Lonnie. I mean, you know, my, my presence in social media, I'm, I'm not exactly a powerhouse here. X spaces count sounds kind of dirty. Is, is the X silent? I'm just going to like, look, like it's a weird, it's just so weird. And in, in every one of their advertising, it says X formerly Twitter. So like, yeah. I think we had made a pact that we're always going to refer to it as Twitter um, in the last presentation I did live, I called it Twitter and someone like shouted me out. I was like, it's X. And I'm like, I know, but it just sounds weird. And I feel uncomfortable saying it. And so uh, I'm going to just like, I think I'm sticking to my guns. Like we're going to say, we're going to maybe host a Twitter spaces. Cause yeah, it's just, just <laughs> weird, man. I'm just going to start making the joke that, you know, some words, the X is silent. So, you know. <laughs> there you go. Well, this is the plug. Follow us on Twitter at Tripwire. And with that, we'll close. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or just a comment, send an email to podcast.trip.com and subscribe to the Tripwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>